And we're live. Welcome to Music Matters with Jason Tram. And thank you so much for joining us for our unique podcast community, where we explore the triumphs and challenges of the performing arts world as seen through the eyes of distinguished artists. And thank you so much for helping us grow. We hit 1,846 subscribers today, and we grow every Thanks to people like you. Please remember to subscribe on YouTube and smash that bell icon for the most up-to-date information on our upcoming guests and topics. And we draw on guests from the classical, the opera, the contemporary, the singer-songwriter. We do world music. We, we, here on Music Matters, we explore many different genres and avenues and fascinating artists. So thank you. To see our over 270 past episodes, check our website at www.jasontram.net. With two, jasontram.net. Again, www.jasontram.net. Today, we have a wonderful guest. We have Mike Errico, who is a, um, a dynamic musician, composer, producer, writer, editor, music supervisor, and way more. A journalist. We can keep going. So many titles. We're going to talk to Mike today. Mike, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. You reached out to me, and I was uh, fascinated by your work. I know you have a book that just okay. came out. We're going to talk about that. But did you always know you wanted to be an artist? Uh, no, I had no idea. Um, I, I, uh, I had no idea and then I had an idea and I resisted. I try, I did everything I could to, uh, not have it. Um, uh, like, yeah, it was like an affliction, I think early on in, in my life. But then again, I have done everything backwards in my life, uh, and backing into, you know, records, uh, journalism career, uh, this book. It, it all actually works if you turn everything at 180 degrees. <laughs> That's the <laughs> artist's way. It never gets, <laughs> the, the, it's never like, a, like one path is a circular path. <laughs> exactly. It's, or at least spiraled. It's as dizzying as, as, you know, that's, that's for sure. Um, and were your, were your parents musical? Are you from a musical family? Uh, yes. My father uh, is a doctor, but is also a concert pianist. Uh, uh, teaches, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, takes lessons even now at Juilliard. He's uh, in the, um, loves classical music. He just told me recently he wants to get in the chamber music. Uh, and uh, he's sort of the reason, again, backwards, but uh, sort of the reason I got into songwriting because he wanted to take a class in contemporary music. And he thought contemporary music was like Schoenberg and 12 tone and whatever like serial music and that kind of stuff turns out it was pop music and he hated it and <laughs> he, he didn't want to be in it but he didn't want to ask for his money back because he thought that sounded cheap so we have the same name and we switched places and i went in his place and that's basically how i started <laughs> uh yeah being a singer songwriter um and then you know two three years after that i got my first record deal and just went on and, and started doing that. Um, what was your first instrument? Well, the first first instrument was piano and that did not work. Uh, uh, switched to trumpet, too loud. I uh, went to get, I wanted to be a drummer, right? That was the thing, uh, but too loud. There was a thing and by, by too loud, not by my standards, by like nobody wanted, in the family wanted to hear it practiced you know what i mean i'm the father of a drummer i can i can well what was that like never oh. ends the tapping never stops the pad practicing when it's midnight uh, and then the drum set of course right i did i did all of that tapping and now for i have two kids of my own uh they came out with the roland uh virtual drums right which you just put the headphones on and you're in madison square garden but nobody has to know uh and my dad actually turned to me, he was like, wow, if we had these back then, your life would have been a lot different. And I was just like, dad, shut up. I don't <laughs> want to hear that because they're, you know, with the, if the drummer doesn't work, nothing works, right? It's just what the, the time is the essence of, of all of it. So I wanted to go Sound right to the- Sound and time. For for sure, and I I was just very uh, connected to the time of things and um, <laughs> thwarted. So then it was electric guitar, but that's too loud. So it was uh, classical. So I started it really like the first thing I did was classical fingerstyle nylon string uh, guitar, Fernando Sor and whatever like all 
Tarega and like all of that. I still love that stuff. And I do keep my right hand fingers long, uh, just in case. <laughs> just in case somebody Sigovia wants. chops. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I do follow a lot of those guys on Instagram and TikTok. Paco de Lucia is like, I'm always excited when, uh, when he comes up uh, on my Instagram feed. Um, that kind of stuff is really uh, still sort of in me. Um, I switched to electric. This is too long an answer. I switched to electric, you know, with the Van Halens and all of that. Uh, but then I got out and into the world. And it turned out that that's not really my nature. And that's another thing about their sound. You mentioned sound. You also mentioned time. Nature is really, if it's a triangle or a trident or whatever, with, with which you're going to stick yourself in the chest, the third fork uh, is the, or the third tine is, uh, is, is voice, you know. And I found that uh, I was much more quiet, introverted, and the ladies noticed. And I ended up uh, getting back on steel string acoustic and backing them and being a side person for female singer-songwriters. So that really is where I began to make some money, you know, and like live. So it was a very weird uh, it's sort of a weird dichotomy because I want to be like tough and whatever. And like, but my nature just doesn't do that. It just doesn't do that. You know, were you naturally singing? Did you sing in choirs growing up? No, no, of course I didn't. Right. Uh, so I was taking jazz guitar, finger style jazz guitar, because it was an outgrowth. And my guitar teacher at the new school, a G amazing player named uh, Glenn Alexander was like, you know what? If you want to play guitar, for the rest of your life, learn how to sing. And I was like, that bad, huh? And he was like, uh, no, I didn't mean it like that. I just meant, you know, you're sitting there with a, an orifice that'll make noise in a, a nice way. And, uh, and uh, why not go for it? And so I started taking lessons. And after years of guitar lessons, I outstripped my guitar playing ability on the voice in like six months. It was, it was asinine, basically. It was like embarrassing. Meant like, to be, right? Meant to be. Just embarrassing, you know? Because I just think about all the years I spent on the wrong instrument. And now that, I think that's why I teach. Because like so much of this stuff is about like finding your voice, finding your instrument, you know? When I am even in proximity to someone who is a drummer, uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I start rambling, thinking about voice, like, what is it like? And that's really what I talked about with, uh, with a lot of the guests in my book. Um, it happens across all sorts of art forms. George Saunders is the person I'm thinking about. Uh, one of the preeminent writers in America um, at the moment uh, wanted to be a singer-songwriter. And I was like, well, what happened? He's like, I stunk at it. I was just, I just wasn't any good at it. I tried and I tried and I can play the guitar really fast and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and it's wrong. It was wrong for me. I can't do it. Cause I saw people like Patti Smith. I saw people who, you know, and you would know as well. I mean, just when you see somebody who is standing in their own light, it is everyone, every, just the atoms in the room change. And when you're doing something you've practiced your rear end off on and you're not standing in your light, it is really frustrating. It is, and like a lot of people will give up, which is, I think, also why I teach. And when I see someone who's standing in their light, I take them aside and I'm like, my friend, that is a door. Don't, you know, please take it from me. I'm not Obi-Wan Kenobi and I'm certainly not a psychic. However, I felt the room change. So there's nothing like the bard when, when you, when someone's telling a story through song and I, I really happen to love the singer songwriter world and uh, how a, one chord and a unique timbre of voice can just grab you. I know. Really I know. And, and uh, pop music is quote unquote simple harmonically and usually simple uh, melodically. And, it is even more frustrating for that reason because like the same person can play the same chord and it's a 
entirely different thing. And it has nothing to do with music. It's the craziest it's, I, it's I, I certainly understand that from my from my, my uh, back of the woods. From as a conductor, you can watch two people do the same phrase, and one is magic, like it's formative Beethoven five, and the other one is just like reading off a score. It's like moving the pieces around the board and the chessboard. But, you know, no real master. Play. <laughs> I I totally remember that because I, I when when CDs were a thing, I would give my dad for birthday or you know, whatever, Father's Day or whatever, I would give him like, he likes Bach. So here's some Bach. He's like, that's the wrong conductor. And I'm just like, what do you mean? It's the same song. He's like, it is entirely different. Wrong performance and, practice, the wrong, right, yeah. The his... wrong, everything, wrong room, the wrong time, the wrong first violin, whatever. And I'm just, and so I, I gave a couple of bum uh, records to him, you know, the wrong Carmina Burana. I think I gave him like three Carmina Buranas. Um, and, uh, and, you know, he likes Ravel, he likes uh, WC, and like, you know, there are thousands of recordings of those. How did your classical background and your background, you know, ever since birth, you know, listening to classical music, how did that affect your songwriting? Um, it's funny, I when when you say that first of all there are there are pieces of music that are just forget it I'll, I'll, will always be embedded in me um tchaikovsky is really the one uh and I, that may also be because i have lived through uh my daughter's uh, ballet days and so the nutcracker uh was a, a obsession in the house but it never got boring um, which is which is really a testament. And like, if you listen to Tchaikovsky, uh, you can hear bits and pieces of songs, pop songs, throughout. It's amazing. It is, it is like going to the well. You know, I could write a melody. <laughs> unbelievable, unbelievable. But the other thing that really got me was not so much what he was, my dad was playing, but being able to sit underneath the piano, like as a kid, like, I don't know. I, I feel like some people have that, but like he had a baby grand in the house, which was always too big for the house, but he had that. And I would go underneath it and it was startling, immersive experience. You, you know, know? I had a similar experience. I, I, read, I, was, I was listening to a podcast and I just blew my mind and I never had an idea. Uh, full disclosure, I'm a humongous rock fan. I really like contemporary music. And I, brought, I had older brothers who loved rock, and I grew up with that. Went into classical in this big life. But I just, you know, this has enabled me to go back into my rock roots, and I just love this conversation. Steven Tyler from Aerosmith, father went to Juilliard. So he would, just, just like you're saying, he would be under the piano listening, and he kind of grew up with that. He was just kind of a rebel in what direction, but he had musical roots. My my dad went to Juilliard. Goes to Juilliard. Went to Juilliard last night. I love know? that. Um, but yes, the under the piano thing is as big as any like monstrous rock show, you know. Um, and it's also odd because you get a sense of scale that is sort of analogous, you know. Um, you are tiny in, in, under that thing, and it's also coming down from from above. Right from Literally. the soundboard, right into your body. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, uh, those like Rachmaninoff, like those kind of things, they're big in the left hand, right? So there's a lot of bass. There's a lot. Lost Mike, we're going to get all again.
man, when the gods of technology aren't kind, what can you do? But we're here with Mike, and Mike is back. And um, so, you know, feeling those vibrations under the piano through your body as a young kid, you know, must have made some impact. It's incredible. It was it was a it was an unforgettable kind of thing. Um, and you know, the the big uh, rock shows that kind of have the same sort of uh, same impulse, same idea. I think you know. Give us a few. What's up? Who are some of the rock artists who've made that impact on you? Well, in a way that's also graceful, I would say um, the most recent Radiohead tour for Moonshape Pool um, was shockingly beautiful uh, and also dynamic, you know, not pummeling like some like some rock shows can be. Um, I'm a huge Pink Floyd fan. So uh, we are too. My son Quentin and I both. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm actually, it's funny. I'm actually sitting here mixing a song and I'm just like, how do I get this to David Gilmore? As if, as if David Gilmore needs a, a Pink Floyd song, but um, I, <laughs> you know what I mean? I should give it to whoever the opposite is. Weird Al. Um, so uh, yeah. So that, that show was unbelievable. Uh, a beautiful lights, but also just really beautiful sonic detail, you know, in a in a room that's meant for hockey, you know what I mean? Like Madison Square Garden is a disaster, but like they made it amazing. Um, I love that. Yeah. Now, now your music is taking you on tour. You you've played with artists such as Bob Weir, Amos D, Derek. I'm right here, Derek Trucks, and so on. Ben Folds, Dan Wilson. So, how did you make the? Um, you, know, you went to school for music, and how did you make that the your start? <laughs> I, you're not going to believe this. I did not go to school for music. Uh, I did it all backwards. Um, I was just doing, this was all stuff I did like sort of on, my, on you know, extracurricularly, whatever. Um, but uh, I went to school for like American studies, history kind of, uh, kind of stuff. Uh, the touring, just one thing sort of turned into another thing. You know, I wrote these songs thanks to this songwriting class. And then I started, you know, being a side person uh, for these uh, for these artists, and thinking to myself, you know what, I can do that. I I I so let's do that. So I started playing the local spots, the bitter ends of the world, and the CBGBs at the time. Um, and I decided uh, we should do this in other cities. <laughs> I mean, the logic is so obvious and so dumb at the same time because it's just like yeah it's called touring mike so actually what i what i first did i didn't have a booking agent or anything i looked from portland maine down to washington dc and i looked for places that had open mic nights and i routed a tour of open mics and i would go night after night and pick a number out of the hat sit around till whatever time it was uh, sleep on friends floors. Um, I actually had an outdoor show on a flatbed, the back of a flatbed truck, and literally played for mosquitoes the way that Cheryl Crow uh, described so well in a song of her own. Um, I was bitten by most of the mosquitoes um, that day, but uh, yeah, that was my first tour, um, and then just. I started filling the rooms in, in, in New York. And then it just started being like, Hey, you know, I live in Pittsburgh. Why don't we swap a date? And you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and then it just started growing, got signed. And that of course helped tremendously. They do say that the stage is the best teacher. And I, I agree with that too. I mean, I learned a lot being in the classroom, but it wasn't until I started working with a master conductor and doing rehearsals and, you know, getting out there and experiencing this like it. Yeah. You know, it's 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 something I've been thinking about a lot because I've always said that, like, play it, play it out. They'll tell you what's what. And I'm not totally 100 percent sure about that anymore. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I can say for a certain type of music, I that's what I was making. I was making music based on, you know, snarky singer songwriters and folkies like uh Ani DeFranco, of course, is like what the biggest example I can give. And like, if I was doing things like they were punchlines, you know, 
but like snarky. And if people reacted, I knew that the song was working. But it's not really true because I knew that I knew that the performance was working, but I wasn't totally a hundred percent sure that the song was working, right? Um, I made a couple of classic mistakes that I uh, tell people to avoid in my book. Uh, things like uh, time stamping it with things like technology. Um, I mentioned O.J. Simpson in a song. Uh, that song is, you know, lives and dies basically on the whole O.J. Simpson trial. So that's done. I have songs with CDs mentioned in them. You know, it's it's hard to expunge all that stuff from a lyric, but. Um, but you think about it, I, I always say like it for in, in classical music, and I teach this, that like music's like an amber that captures everything that's going on around it. So like a piece of this got a historical reference. I find that very, very valuable. It's the same as when I'm studying Beethoven. I want to know what was going on in his life, and I want to kind of picture some of, like you couldn't do the Third Symphony without knowing about Napoleon and kind of the right. Napoleonic Wars and his personal like, struggle with that. Right. I mean, that's, I mean, that's such a, it's such a perspective on classical music as something of weight. You know, I feel like a lot of pop music is treated and almost like thought of in a positive light as, you know, as newspaper, you know, fish, fish wrapping for the next day kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Isn't that interesting? I mean, it's, it's fascinating. I, 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 so much popular music, I mean, like radio, top 40 radio music is written to be immediately consumed. I say it's like a big back, right? It's like you eat it and it's gone. You don't remember it, but it's there. Remember Backstreet Boys, like that song came out. They were like, came out, Backstreet's back. Like, yo, 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 1998 or whatever it was. I'm like, well, Jesus, it's 2022. You know, <laughs> I, what do I, you know, it's, it's great as a time capsule. Yes, I understand. I, I understand that. But like, also, you're kind of shooting for timeless. Also, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's timeless. There's a lot of Beatles stuff that seemed to uh, skirt that kind of thing. You know, I'm always amazed when like my, my undergraduates walk in the room and you know, I ask them if a percentage of them have never seen a live show before, classical, contemporary, yeah. rock. Everything's here, right? Everything's on the on the air, earphones and and their, your computer device, phone these days. But it's just amazing to me how, um, you know, but you'll see so much of Led Zeppelin shirts and Beatles shirts and kids who listen to Frank Sinatra. I mean, it's it's really interesting how some things just stay in the public conscious. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've uh, heard or not, but there's a new album by uh, Father John Misty. I've heard Cra it. Crazy. It's like pulling from all the Sinatra... Dusty Springfield, like they're all like big or orchestral kind of sounds. It's really fun. I feel like it's a little bit ironic, but also it he's an odd bird because like, yes, maybe he is ironic, but he's also kind of awesome, <laughs> you know? So there's like a point where irony actually ends and like he's kind of undeniable, I think, in some, in, in some fashions. And it's because he's bringing back, you know, some of that, uh, of that kind of material. Um, so the, that's the good part of the internet is that everything is available, right? That, that is the interesting. We, we say it's like white noise. Like, you know, how does an artist, like we talk about this all the time in my podcast, how artists break through the white noise, how do indie artists create a, the space for themselves? And some of them have uh, getting millions of listens and they've kind of find a way to do that, but it's so hard for yeah. up and coming artists to do that. Yeah. Um, the, my, I have students who are now, household names and so watching them from obscurity to to the present um a lot of it is out of their control um and i think that's really the the biggest constant among all of those things yes talent yes looks yes the song yes you know you know but there's luck there's timing there's uh how things move against uh, events, current events. Um, I, I had, uh, it's not a tragedy, but like it was a bummer anyway that I, there was a band that really put out, I think their best work the day of lockdown oh. for, for the pandemic. And it was like, it was a drag. And I've also heard of people, you know, back in the day who, had a release date of September 11, 2001, you know, like you just don't, 
know what's going to what's going to happen. And so in my class and in my book, I try to tell them to not worry about it, you know. So uh, tell us to, about your book, Music, Lyrics, and Life. Yeah, I mean, well, that's that's basically, uh, I, I feel like the more I talk about it, the more it's about life and the less it's about music and lyrics. But um, uh, every year, every semester, I've, I've seen a really significant artist uh, be injured, die, take their life, or in some way, uh, leave the earth uh, for something that you could actually uh, um, attribute back to the lifestyle and to the incredible insecurity of living in the arts. Um, so to me, one of the greatest things that you and I can actually do as educators is to figure out how to steal our students to this, uh, this sort of fact and this sort of truth. Um, we just don't know. We don't, we don't know what great is, right? I mean, what we, all we can do is come up with our own opinion and stick to it. Um, it's very hard for students today. I, I really feel that the, the lockdown has been so hard for all of society and, you know, I'm really yeah. trying hard to, you know, be there for the students when I can be. It's, it's, uh, such a challenge. I mean, we saw the devastation in the arts more than almost anybody. I mean, all of my colleagues on Broadway and the Metropolitan Opera, I started this oh podcast God. because me and my friends were just bitching online, we're on, whether on Skype or Zoom. And I'm like, why don't we do that in front of people? Start the show. But that's um, great. That's a great thing. I mean, that's, that's, I think that's what a lot of people needed. Um, and I, I think the sense of isolation that the pandemic has caused has caused a lot of secondary tertiary problems um, that hopefully things like getting together uh, under a tent of some sort would actually maybe help, which, and that includes the arts, that includes performances, live performances uh, of, of any sort, you know? Um, I think that's what a lot of people have missed. Um, and I think when you you get weird when uh, when you become isolated, they call it solitary confinement. It's not a it's not a gift. The you worst know? torture you can endure is that, isn't it? <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, I've been in this. I was in this basement. I mean, long enough to read all those books and to uh, and to write write one of my own. And and so it was um, it was weird. So uh, I mean, you take it, away the primary reason that people who are performers exist, and then it's like. And what I was fascinated with when we were done bitching was artistic innovation made during challenging times. So I said, we're on to something here because I saw opera singers giving voice lesson techniques from the Met who are on TikTok. I saw people uh, selling, creating jewelry. I saw people, you know, people were so creative in other ways. I was just amazed by that kind of transformation and, um, and people got, got people through. And now that people came out of the, there was a famous opera singer who learned how to code who now on the road still has a coding job because we know how fragile the performing can actually be. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's, that's really true. And I, I feel like what those things are is sort of like, I guess you could uh, uh, make an analogy to sun sign and moon signs in astrology, which is something I do not ascribe to, but there is, uh, there is your primary uh, art. And then there are secondary arts that also want to be expressed through you. Um, and when I'm in office hours with students at, generally i'm in there because they have called for office hours and they're confused in some way and one of my first questions is what else do you do you know uh is that first thing uh helpful is that is that second thing really a first thing that's hiding behind the first because that's basically what what has happened happened to me um and how can they uh inform each other or how can you blend them or mix them in a way that is going to be more sustainable and make you feel more secure in living and continuing to create. So Beautiful. that's like, thank you for sharing that. Now, how did you make the, the, um, the journey from a uh, performer, songwriter to educator? Well, it happened backwards as you can probably imagine. I was on linear fashion. <laughs> right. I was on the, the road and I got a call, uh, from a friend 
who is the dean of a school and asked me to come in and talk to his students uh, because they the, the students have interest in music and popular music and there was no curriculum uh, for uh, to, to help them. And I said to my friend, I don't know if I know how to do that. I don't think I have anything to tell anybody. <laughs> you know, I'm like five, six records down. I have two record deals and TV shows and stuff. And I'm like, I, I don't think I have anything to tell anybody. He's like, you know what? I'm going to book you. And uh, let's just see. Let's see how little you have to say. So I went and it was amazing. It was like an aha kind of crazy moment. And every question that was asked of me, I actually was like, oh yeah, well, I had, I had all the answers, you know, for that particular day. And I was like, wow, I, uh, I know something. I, I, something I, teaching taught me that I knew something that, and that there was more to learn. And that also at the end of the day, I don't know anything, you know? Um, isn't, that, isn't that the truth, though? I mean, I, I find the same thing. Whenever I, you know, I I, I finished my doctorate and I, I got offered two teaching jobs, I turned them down to become an opera conductor. Took over an opera company, ran it for eight years, and um, then went back to university teaching. I find that I have so much more to teach because I was on the road and I, I you know, you absorb all that, and then you have something to share, and it's just it just lights up because I get to share what I've learned and and watch people, and then I am constantly reevaluating how I teach and how I produce. Right. I mean, that's that what I give to them. It's like leapfrogging. What I give to them, I get from the ones before me, you know, so I it really becomes a link in a chain that is productive and generous, which is something that I feel like sometimes the performing arts uh, misses. I think there's a tremendous amount of narcissism involved in being Never. a performer definitely not <laughs> in the in opera <laughs> right and that's kind of hard um it's it's hard to uh if if you're not a hundred percent drawn that way it's it's difficult to um to sacrifice for it you know where whereas i think the teaching gives you that performative sort of uh jolt but is also it has a generous sort of spirit behind it um, so that's that's sort of where I sort of uh, took uh, you know took the teaching, and then of course I had nothing I had no book to teach, so I wrote it. So now I'm, you know, it's a much easier way to, to take my course just by buying a book because of course there is also the concept of the uh, the cost of tuition, right? So there's an access problem uh, to to that sort of wisdom as well. So. In the way that bands like Fugazi tried to keep ticket sales down, uh, the book for me is the class with the ticket sale down. So, I'm glad it's out there and helping a lot of people. Now you're on the, currently on the faculty at Yale and at the NYU's Clive Davis Institute. Is that correct? Well, I bounce. I bounce around. Um, I teach. I have taught, I should say, at Wesleyan, Yale lectured and such at, at, at Berkeley. Uh, but this particular semester, I'm teaching at the New School and at NYU's Clive Davis Institute. Clive, uh, NYU is really like my my base that I radiate from. And uh, so, and then second would probably be you. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I have been doing that. Also, you know, performing, speaking, uh, I, I do some TV work, some consulting work, and that kind of stuff. You know, whatever. I love it. You know, for me too. I get to keep my performing career intact. I get to travel. I get to kind of map out what repertoire I want to do and what recording projects yeah. I want to do. But then I get to go back in the classroom, and you know, it's, we're very fortunate to do what we love and get to do it and inspire young minds. I love. Uh, yeah, I I really enjoy it, and I think they probably inspire me more than I inspire them. I probably annoy them more than 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 anything, but. Um, you know, they're good sports uh, about it. Um, and yeah, I just, I'm, I'm able to, you know, I keep just a lot of balls, a lot of balls in the air. So um, tell us about your, your thoughts. Who better to ask? What's it like in the indie circuit today? What's it like in the pop music? I mean, people are going to say rock and roll is dead and I, I don't buy any of that, but, but what do you, what do you say about the state of contemporary music in America? Uh, well, I mean, 
I don't, you know, <laughs> that word rock and roll is so odd. Uh, and it's not just me talking. I mean, uh, Dolly Parton didn't want to be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or she she declined her nomination. We changed that again. Yeah. <laughs> when they offered it to her. <laughs> yeah, well, they offered to her and now she's going to be in and then that's it. And you, uh, and she's like, and so I'm not sure what that term is. That term is a spirit. Maybe I know that there are bands that have come out of my class who are, and, and of course, a lot out of these schools um, who would absolutely uh, work as rock bands. I mean, like Pom Pom Squad is a punk rock, you know, pop punk band, Charlie Bliss, uh, the Bobby Lees, like they're, I mean, if you listen to these bands, they are tight, raunchy, awesome, you know, and being uh, produced by, you know, people like John Spencer and people who are like stalwarts in the indie, uh, indie scene. Um, so, um, tons of great stuff is coming out. Um, the, uh, the TikTok world is where so much of it is happening. Of course. I mean, everyone seems to know that, but it really is true. I do have students waking up to 4 million views of something. They just farted out on this, put down their bedside. Uh, you know, and it could be a Kanye. It, it is it is insane that there are people who can, um, you know, people the the level of work that people can do at their home studios now is is mind boggling. Oh my god! Yeah, well, that's that's a beautiful thing. I have to say, uh, having been pushed and shuffled through very large studios, um, having the ability to sit and get something right feels really great to me personally. You know. Um, uh, there, and then again, there is an opposite, uh, theory, which is like, if you're thinking too hard, you're not doing it right. Get it right. Get it. The first take, best take, fast take, best take. Um, anyway, so that's, I mean, that's just a way to sort of think about it. Um, so, uh, yeah, they're out there. They're doing great work. I think they're understanding the internet uh, much better um, uh, certainly than the, than the indie people before them. But you know what? They're also doing exactly the same stuff. There's, there's nothing new under the sun, you know, uh, connecting with fans is, you know, on a one-to-one -one basis just happened. It happened more via, you know, couch surfing and playing shows, house shows, but they're still playing house shows. They're still doing that. Um, they have different tools. Some are better, but more people have them. It's pretty interesting about that. You know, what would it be like? There was a mystique around the artists of the past. When the Beatles came to town, you didn't know what uh, George Harrison had for lunch or what uh, John Lennon was, uh, you know, what sneakers he was wearing. I mean, these yeah. are like the mysteries around the old. When Led Zeppelin came to town, they were like gods descending from the chariots. 100%. Today, it's like, that. what did they have for lunch? You know, it's it's I, I could not agree more. And like, you know, I, I feel like publicists at major labels and even indie labels and stuff like that, honestly, at the end of the day, don't know what to do. They don't know how to manufacture these 4 million views or whatever. So their thing is make your act, tell everybody what's for lunch. More, 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 more content, more, more, more. But um, some of my, I feel like some of my, former students are doing things now like they're backing off they're going away facebook is a is a long gone situation um but like things even like twitter are dying like there's a couple of things that are sort of dying but i had a moment elon musk has 44 million uh, 44 billion dollars uh, 44 billion uh, <laughs> exceptions to what you just said yeah and and for politics i'm sure it's going to be great um uh Good news almost never breaks on that thing, though. I never. <laughs> but here's the, here's the thing that got me exact to what you were just saying. It was it was the moment where I was like, "Wow, this is not right." It was Slash from Guns N' Roses, the guitar player. He is funny on Instagram. My God, his posts make me laugh. Right? <laughs> yeah, he, he is. But he was on Twitter. It was, and this is we're going way back. But like, he was on Twitter, and he was at the dentist. 
and and like it, there was like a picture of him and like the like the, the you know that machine that you sit next to that has the water you gargle whatever and he was like at the dentist man dentists suck and i'm like slash does not go to the dentist the slash in my mind doesn't go to the dentist he does his teeth his teeth are steel his 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 you know what i mean his muscles are or I don't know what. He's wearing a top hat and he's just chilling, exactly. and smoking a cigarette. Yeah, <laughs> right. His whole, all of his blood is is whiskey, right? Like everything. He's not human. He's this thing, and he's he's probably in like garbage at some garbage. At, the top hat's off. The it, and he looks terrible, and and his mouth is open just like me. I don't want him to be just like me, you know. Good point. Um, and. You know, some people, some people love that, um, but I feel like Mystique is always, you know, Mystique is larger than the internet. I find that you know, social media can be such a two-edged sword for teenagers, especially knowing I've, I have four of kids my own. But um, you know, same for um, the bands. I mean, I, I guess so you get a point where you where you get so used to that adrenaline hit that it's like, you know, how yeah. do you form separation? Yeah, I, 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 you know, some people can do it really well because they are performative by nature, you know, um, and and people are really um, there's they're, uh It's just a good medium for them. They're just good in the medium. Some people are good at watercolor. You know, some people are good at TikTok. I don't know. Um, but uh, sometimes it just doesn't seem to uh, it doesn't seem to translate uh very well but there are great performative uh people doing it um and when it's done badly it's a huge bummer it's a it's a, <laughs> it's a huge bummer you know um but everyone people is pushing ruin to do themselves it. on social media. you see people ruin themselves on social media You're like what are oh you god. doing <laughs> oh my god getting into it getting into a fight on twitter nobody nobody wins just nobody wins i was a public school teacher for five years before i did my doctorate and uh, left that world i was a high school music teacher and um the, the rule was if you're arguing with a student you lost in front of the class right you yeah. there's never a reason to do that it never works so it's yeah. probably the same you know with the social media if you're arguing with a bunch of nameless people you've lost <laughs> right uh you know the customer's always right or the troll the troll wins because the troll just wants to fight so if you're fighting, he won. It won, whatever it is. Um, uh, I make the mistake sometimes of reading the comments and going down the hole, and I really try. It's I really try to get out of that. I, 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 you know, and I my my students uh, are hindered. I think more than not by it, partially because they will come to me with drafts that are brave weird out of the box and then they do it and they are brave and they steal themselves in the class and we hear it and it's really cool and interesting and they're like yeah but i can never release it because it's not consistent with my brand and it's like you don't that was your brand your brand just walked in mm. you know your brand is your character that's who you are so just do that and, 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 you know, if you're a young person, it's going to change. You're an artist, man. You're going to be, you know, I, I tell my, everyone, my students, and that it's like the music, the music career is a marathon, not a sprint, right? It's uh, yeah. when you're my age at 47, I'm a very different conductor than I was when I was 25. I mean, geez, what did I know back then? I've yeah. deepened my relationship with it. It's going to happen to them many times. Yeah. And the, the one, one thing that, that bums me out for them is that, yes, it is a marathon. You're right. Um, but you can never outrun your last mile, you know? So you're always reminded, or you're, oh, it's always brought back that, you know, here's your, you know, high school, uh, you know, sax solo that when, you know, you fell off stage or whatever it was, or when you hit all those bad notes or whatever, you know, you, you can't outrun your high school photographs of yourself. Um, and it's, it's, either a it can be a huge bummer um and it's hard to pivot and it's hard to grow that way um because when you're looking forward you're trying not to create a bad past which is is bananas 
That is like the, the I way tell to my get... students, no matter how much you've achieved, you're only as good as your next performance. Right. 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 But all your performances are there and they're available for everyone. And it's that to me is a, is unfortunate because you never get a clean slate. And that's something that I've, we've decided my, my wife and I have decided for my kids that, I mean, up until right till things like this, I, I have never admitted that they exist, <laughs> you know, and uh, we never post pictures and like, we're going to give them the gift of a clean Google search, hopefully a clean ish, you know, um, and uh, that way they can, they can create that history, hopefully for themselves. It's a crazy thing to think about, you know, and it's only been a generation, right. That's how to even conceive of this. Right. Right. Like I, uh, you know, my worst moments were, you know, are not available because <laughs> it was not a thing, you know, there, this was like, we were still flip phoning, you know what I mean? There, it was, it was not, uh, people weren't carrying microcomputers with incredible 4k film in their pocket. Exactly. There's no HD garbage of, of, of me. I mean, my first record was on two inch analog tape. I mean, uh, it was available. I mean, you know, the Apple, you know, whatever, like uh, digital recording was, 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 was available, but it was still like, no, no, it's just not there yet. It's just not, you know, so it was two inch tape. And uh, it's amazing how things come back again. I hear artists are starting to record on analog again. And of yeah. course we know that the, the, that vinyl has come back with a storm. I'm seeing indie artists sell vinyl so they can market this. So obviously there's no one making money per se on the streaming services. It's they're so, it's such a poor business model. We yeah. had um, Stacy Woodlets on the Woodlets on the show, who wrote um, "She's Like the Wind" from Dancing uh, Dance, uh, uh, Patrick Swayze movie. Uh, Dirty Dancing. Dirty Dancing, right? He was on the show, and he was like, "Yeah, we got like thirty-nine million downloads, and I made like seven hundred bucks last year." Right. I mean, it's crazy. So right. if if that's the type of like you know, so people are starting to sell their merchandise like that and use that as a as a you know that plus live performance as a chance to make a living. Yeah, I. It's funny because people do buy the vinyl. I don't think they play it. Right? Do they play it? I have no idea. I don't have a yeah. record player anymore. Not what? Also, like I um I was just today I was given a, someone sent me a CD. Um, my. Mac doesn't have a CD drive. Mine, my car, my car is the last generation of cars going to have a CD player. Gonna... Right. I mean, I bought like a little like peripheral CD player, but like it's, you know, it's, this is, this is not, we're out of the mainstream here. This is like, you have to sell something else. And yeah, that's crazy. That's I, another reason I tell, I asked my, my students, like, what else do you do? What's, what are your other interests? Because you're going to have to hybridize, you know? And it could be production. It could be mastering. I have some great mastering engineer, former students, um, mixing, uh, you know, any, you know, and kind of anything uh, that's related, business related, uh, you know, music uh, attorneys, uh, you know, people like that. Um, whatever keeps the lights on. You know. So important. And, you know, you have to always keep yourself inspired. Yourself as a singer-songwriter and, and a teacher, how has your teaching inspired your singer-songwriting of today that you're writing? Um, it has, it, I mean, there, it's always inspiring, uh, you know, every, every uh, class, you know, they, they just bring in songs. And so what's happened is I, I feel like I've become a really good editor and consultant for others, because it's about that standing in your light thing. Like what section, what section is is glowing a little bit differently than the, than the others? And how can we work around that so that the whole thing is glowing? Um, so that's, that's really helped. And it's also opened up, I think, a lot of influences uh, that they, they bring in. Um, and also, uh, I've just sort of let go of a lot of things. I just finished writing an EP and like, I kind of don't really know what it's about. You know, it's, um, I really just tried to generate just words, you know, like, and, and come to something 
intrinsically and just trust something intrinsic and just see what happens. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have to put it out. No one ever has to hear it. Um, and, uh, and that's just been fun. You know, when you're around people having fun, it's kind of hard to be like the sad sack in the room. You know what I mean? So like, I, I'm certainly not that, you know, so that, that's very, they've been really great for that. I'm sure that the future is a bright place. We have so much talent out there. Reverb Nation sends me, uh, every three months, they send me 5,000 artists to wade through, and I, I love it. It's like, for me, you know, there's a lot of ones I don't like, and I, I try to identify uh, 5 to 20 that I can have on the show, and people, I really love their music from across the world. And it's just so exciting to discover something that I didn't know before. I, I can only imagine how it was wow. for you with all these talented young people who are going to write the next generations of great music. Oh, yeah. Wow. I, I didn't know that Reverb Nation did that. That's so funny. And they have so many people on that roster. That's incredible. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I can think of a few myself if you want to talk to them. I would love to. Uh, Always looking to yeah. tell great they're, stories. Yeah, they're, they're great. The, uh, mm -hmm. Shorter stories, younger folks. <laughs> I've had a couple of rock bands I had on them, and they, they're like kids. They're like, you know, kids my kid's age. And I'm like... Okay, so I, I don't have the depth to talk about, but I love to hear their fresh take on the world because it, it yeah. reminds me. It, I, I always learn too. I'm like, you know, musicians can teach each other so much. Yeah, I, I I've been doing a lot of reading of autobiographies and biographies lately. I'm now wading through. I'm about halfway through uh, the Ricky Lee Jones mm. uh, memoir. What a life! Oh my god! Oh my god! And she's only 15. I'm on page 150. <laughs> She's living in a cave in Big Sur. I and like eating beans out of a can. I don't know what she's, you know, it's crazy what what, what she's doing. So yeah, it can be pretty nuts pretty quick. <laughs> so Mike, this has been amazing talking to you. Where can people go to find out more about your work and your upcoming research and your book and your your music? Sure. Uh well, you know, there's there's Google, of course. Uh there's Erico.com, uh, which is my my hub. Where all my uh, where all my goings on go on, um, but uh, yeah, and uh, the the book is out. Um, it's doing great. It's in its second printing now, and um, it's available everywhere. Uh, I have signed personally signed books that you can buy off Bandcamp, which I think is great. It's a great service for indie artists. If you're not checking out Bandcamp, I, I, I hope I hope you are. Um, and of course, there's Jeff Bezos's territory. Uh, heard of that group? I've heard of that company before. Yeah, it's a company, <laughs> the Bezos company, is, it, and that it's it's there. It's available there. Um, but I would recommend uh, going to your local bookstore. I would recommend going there, even if you're not going to buy my book. I would just go. There's lots of great books. There's the Ricky Lee Jones book, <laughs> for one. Um, uh, yeah, I just bought a couple of books the other day. Um, so uh, I would recommend going there. Uh, Erico.com, E-R-R-I-C-O.com. And, you know, I, I, I keep that pretty spiffy. So, so it, things are, things are there. So you can check them out. You know, Mike, thank you so much for joining us today on Music Matters and continued success. Ah, you too. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on Music Matters with Jason Tran. Please remember to subscribe on YouTube and smash that bell icon. Thank you for joining us today. Remember, keep music alive. We're off the air.